from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. My name is Camille Salas, and I'm a program support assistant with INDIP in the Office of Strategic Initiatives. Since we are recording this session, I hope you don't mind if I ask you to put, place your phones on silent. Um, otherwise, that will be recorded for all history to hear. Um, for over a year, I've had the opportunity to work on the ViewShare.org project at the Library of Congress. And today, I'm happy to introduce ViewShare to new users and describe some of the ways in which users throughout the country are using ViewShare. Today's agenda is to introduce and define what ViewShare is, provide a little bit of history about the project itself, and provide some examples of ViewShare inside and outside of the library. I'll then give a slide demonstration of how to use ViewShare with a data set of postcards depicting historical locations in Fairfax, Virginia. Following the demonstration, I'll offer some helpful hints for using ViewShare and mention some resources that can assist you as you create your views. Finally, after the slide presentation, I'll do a live demonstration of ViewShare itself. I'm happy to take questions as we go through the presentation as well. Just let me know. So ViewShare in brief. It's a free app web application that makes it possible for cultural heritage institutions to create visualizations such as timelines, maps, and facets from collection data. The visualizations or views allow audiences to explore digital collections. Just to give you a brief history of ViewShare itself. In 2009, ViewShare was originally developed to provide access to digital collections selected for preservation as part of INDIP through a shared interface, which is ViewShare. Two years later, the tool was made public after re the realization that would benefit many cultural heritage institutions. As of this past May, ViewShare reached a great milestone, and now there are over 2,000 users using ViewShare. Currently, we're working on enhancements to continue to meet user needs. And you'll see that there'll be later on this year some consolidation of some of the steps I go through. But the basic workflow of ViewShare will be the same as you import your collection data and then you generate views based on that data. And this is the current homepage of ViewShare.org. And I'd like to point out a couple things about it. If you'll notice on the far right hand side, you could click on the green box to request a free account. It usually takes about 24 hours um, to get that information concerning your login. On the box below it, you can click on the watch screencast button to see an introductory ViewShare video. And then below that is a get started button that takes you to some helpful resources for ViewShare. Next to that is a panel of different views that you can click on to further explore the different types of views people have created. And below that panel, you'll see the basic workflow of ViewShare, the import collections button, the generate views button, and then if you so like, you can embed your view, like the one shown above, into a website. So the main idea behind ViewShare is that cultural heritage institutions have data that is temporal, locative, and categorical. And all of these types of data could be mapped to create really engaging visualizations for users, audiences, and cultural heritage institutions themselves to connect with um, different collections. So for example, let's put this idea in context. You can take the data in this spreadsheet. So you see the name of the postcard. You see the city and state for where the historical location is, the related date, which is our temporal information, of course, description of the postcard, and the categorical information. We'll take this data in a spreadsheet and create this type of view. So it's been mapped. And on the side, you can see that users have the ability to kind of go through the different facets. It may be searched by date or category or name. Currently, anyone affiliated with a cultural heritage institution can sign up to use ViewShare. And that in group includes and is not limited to the individuals listed here. So there's archivists, curators, librarians, all using this tool, as well as um, students and information professionals. But ultimately, they're all seeking a way to better understand their collections and create access to them. So with that in mind, I thought I'd present some examples of the way that ViewShare is being used by users outside of the library. So individuals have used ViewShare for a variety of subjects. And these are just a few that offer different perspectives on using the platform. 
These views have been written about in blog posts that can be found in the library's digital preservation blog, The Signal, or under the ViewShare user stories if you're interested in learning more about them. These examples also illustrate the breadth of which ViewShare can be used. So with respect to art collections, ViewShare offers the ability to show galleries of images, which makes it really conducive for the sharing of art collection images and metadata. Now this view does have a gallery view, but I wanted to instead focus on the map view. Lauren Algie, an archivist at the National Gallery of Art, created this view based on metadata about Samuel H. Crest collections across the country. So you'll notice that she, what she did is she created the spreadsheet, and in that spreadsheet she had created a list of all the different um, museums and cultural heritage institutions that include Samuel H. Crest collections. So one thing that was discovered during this is that maybe it's not as uniformly distributed as you'd like. You'll notice a gap in the middle of the country, if you will, the northwest side of the country. Other users could use this view to kind of narrow down information about their own particular um, cultural institution close by. So for example, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and if I wanted to find out more about the H. Crest collection there, what I would do is I could either click on the pin designating El Paso Museum of Art, or I could go to the institution a box on the side and look for El Paso Museum of Art and click on that. Once I click on that, the seller box will be narrowed down as well as the purchase date and then the price. So that allows me as a user to find out more about the collection that's close by to me. The other thing it does for archivists like Lauren is that it kind of tells them not only about the distribution of collections, but maybe other sor sorts of ways to represent their data. You can see that Lauren played with different visualizations at the top of the view. So she played with the list, she played with the gallery function, she created a map, she also looked at pie chart functionality. For those interested in learning more about Lauren's experience in creating ViewShare, there is a article that she published this past November. So as I mentioned with the art collection views, um, this is one that I recently worked on. It's the Rhizome Art Base. And this is a sample from a larger collection of an online archive of new media art that was created using a spreadsheet that in also included dates, public image URLs, and you can see the images here, and artists and materials information. I looked at the Crest Collection view as inspiration in creating this rhizome art-based view. And easily, I already saw I was able to make connections between the images and the materials and technologies used. Another interesting discovery I made was when certain artists decided to use or abandon different types of software in creating their images. So this could be of use for digital archivists who are maybe interested in learning about um, when artists were interested in different types of software, say Adobe, um, or were, were really into using HTML and when that changed to other types of software. And then it could be used in the planning of preserving of media art. The next view traces the desegregation of Virginia education. The view was created by a special collections librarian and university archivist at Old Dominion University in response to requests for materials on the desegregation of Virginia schools. The librarian noted that the library was looking for a tool that would display their catalog materials in a way that engaged potential users, including educators, scholars, and the public. They also wanted something that was not going to require IT maintenance and was free. ViewShare fit all of their needs. So they were able to make really great use of the timeline and mapping capabilities and visualizing their catalog. If an individual was interested in information about the 1950s, they could look at this timeline and then look for the decade signaling um, that era and then find out what types of repositories hold information for that era. And that's the way that their users can go about using this visualization of information. The user story about this is also on the ViewShare website. This funeral records view was made possible by a digital archivist at Stephen F. Austin University. A funeral home in Texas owns these records and was not yet ready to donate them to the university. So instead, they reached a resolution that they would digitize the records and then the university archivist would be able to display them. She was also looking for a tool, much like the librarian at Old Dominion University, that it would allow the visualization was free and easy to use and ViewShare fit her needs. While this is not her original view, this view was actually created by Trevor Owens of the Library of Congress and also a lead on the ViewShare project. And what he did was he exported the data 
and then he was able to find some really interesting qualitative information coming from the records. So he looked at the age of death for individuals, and then he also noticed this other numerical um, data for death year. So an, in, an individual interested in looking at when, how old people were when they died, they can um, go ahead and use this chart to do so. They can also make some really interesting discoveries about maybe the race and ethnicity and religions about the individuals, maybe in conjunction to how old they were when they died. So even though the digital archivist at Stephen F. Austin University didn't create this view, she did hear about it, and she thought it was a great representation of the way that ViewShare could be used by researchers to extract that data and then come up with their own discoveries and findings. Finally, the SWAG Diplomacy Guide was created by a professor at Clark Atlanta University. Now she created the view based off an Excel file that tracked the travels of African American authors. The professor was looking for a way to visualize her information, to share it with her students. And what she did in creating the Excel file was she noted the name of the traveler, noted the place they traveled to, and then provided some more descriptive information about that. So an individual who wants to use this can click on either the traveler or the place and find out which authors visited that place or which travelers, um, find out more about the travelers and the authors and what they wrote. She used this in conjunction with the book that she was writing and she was hoping it would serve as a resource for her students. Now those were some of the external examples of users around the country that are using ViewShare. And these are some internal examples that I'd like to share. This slide shows the view for an inventory of Russian digital collections created by Erica Spencer, who works in the European division. Erica had created an inventory of Russian collections that had been digitized and was looking for a way to showcase them. She was hoping to use a database and was hoping that to make that database public to people. But due to in internal security restrictions, she was unable to. She attended a ViewShare workshop and thought that the tool would be a great fit for sharing the database that she had created. So she once again created a spreadsheet like many of the individuals we discussed have. And uh, it had a list of the collection. and. Um, below this, and I know you can't see this, there's some really great information about contact names, where the repository is located, um, and also the time periods on the side for which the repository covers. As I've talked to Erica about this view, she mentioned to me it's become a really great resource for individuals who are looking at Russian and Slavic studies. And even though it's very simple and doesn't have a lot of the bells and whistles of perhaps the other views, it really does um, its job in being a central repository for people looking for information on Russian digital collections. Now, this next slide is a scan of a few documents that come from the Manuscripts Division. This past spring, I met with Julie Miller, who's a historian in the Manuscripts Division, who first heard about ViewShare in December at a Women's History Discussion Group meeting. Julie has been able to use ViewShare for a set of maritime documents, including these, um, in order to, let's see here. So per her wording, and I don't wanna get this wrong because she really said it so articulately, the sample consists of a group of documents, Accession 491, purchased by the Library of Congress in 1903 from rare book dealer C.S. Hook for $33. About 88 ships are represented. Each of these small collections, ranging in size from one to five documents each, was separately cataloged by the library. So Julie created a spreadsheet based on the information contained in the documents and used ViewShare to share it. And this is Julie's current view. As you can see, she extracted ship names, ports, captains, the list of the ships is in the middle, cargo on the side, and languages. And let me tell you a little bit more about this in Julie's words. The table uses information in the documents to quantify and track information about ports, cargoes, captains, languages, and more. The visualization that ViewShare makes possible has brought previously hidden information to light. Notably, the table makes it possible to see that most of these were trading ships, schooners traveling between Baltimore and the West Indies, between the American Revolution and the War of 1812, carrying such goods as sugar, coffee, cocoa, and dye woods. Scholars, students, and others interested in the history of the West Indies, captains and port officials, even the manifestation of the French Revolution in France's Caribbean colonies, where place names and even the calendar were written, and many other subjects will find these documents a fruitful resource. We hope eventually to include images of the documents, some of which include beautiful engravings. 
And of course, we saw some of these engravings in these scanned documents. Finally, Amber Peranek and Charles Bean collaborated on a view showcasing a list of freely available U.S. newspaper archive and indexes online. At present, the list exists um, on the website for the newspaper and current periodical reading room. But they thought creating a visual map would be a perfect way for users to easily locate newspaper archives from a particular city and state in the U.S. So at the moment, you can see the table, and then you can see that there's a small link to the map and timeline that they created based on that table. And this is the view that viewers can see once they click on that link. In the future, they plan to work on additional maps that display online for newspaper archives. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start with a slide demonstration on how to use ViewShare, and I hope you found those examples helpful. So as a first step, and as I mentioned before, please sign up for a free account. It's painless and it's harmless. Um, so you definitely want to do that as a first step. And you want to have your data ready to go. If you're, you don't have a data set in mind just yet, you can definitely download a free sample from the ViewShare website. And we'll be using that spreadsheet that I showed earlier, which is a spreadsheet depicting historical locations in Fairfax, Virginia. And here's our spreadsheet, just to refresh your memory. You'll notice our temporal data, our locative data, and our categorical data. Okay, so once you log in, this is the user dashboard. And the user dashboard shows your name. It shows perhaps some connections you may have made with other ViewShare users, and you could easily access some of their views. This is all on the left-hand side. And then if you take a look at the right-hand side, there's some links that you can click on to go back to home to our helpful user's guide as well. And then it also shows you any data you currently have pending that you haven't made into a view just yet. The other thing you can do from here, of course, is upload your data. So once we click on that green upload data button, we're given multiple options for import. Currently, there are five options, and we've been talking a lot about the spreadsheets option, and we'll use that one today as well. And you can also use CSV. I've noticed for that larger files, um, if you have more than hundreds of objects, you probably want to work with the CSV file. Um, but Excel, of course, works as well. The XML mods file is also an option. And we just added the JSON data option, which we talked about in a blog post in April for those who are interested. I actually used some Twitter data and uploaded that into ViewShare and looked at some interesting information about um, Twitter responses and tracked um, information about weather as well using some other JSON um, URLs. The OAI, OAI option and also the content DM. While I won't go over these in detail today, I, I definitely recommend going to the ViewShare website to read and learn more about them. Okay, so once we selected our ViewShare option, we just wanna go to, uh, we're taken to the upload a file screen. And as you'll notice, we wanna select our file and um, the file is in an accessible <laughs> location, of course. So once we choose that file, we'll go ahead and press, press the green upload button again and upload the file that we selected. And ViewShare pulls in our data. So this is what our first um, interface, if you will, with ViewShare looks like when it grabs the information from the spreadsheet and it creates our data set. If you'll notice, the column headers that were in the spreadsheet have been used to create fields. So we have our category image. And granted, it's not in the same order, but that can be changed later. So don't fret if you see that things are a little bit out of order at the time. Um, that's perfectly normal. So you'll notice our main um, categories and fields, if you will. You'll notice that there is a default of text type, and we'll adjust that in a minute because not all of our fields are text, of course. The values that came with the spreadsheet are also um, brought in. And you'll notice at the top it says one of 22. So if you share will count how many objects were in your original data set. And that's a good way to do QA to make sure that ViewShare brought everything in. And if you don't need all the fields, you can definitely delete a record. And you'll notice at the top, there's also a tip box. And some people sometimes gloss over it, but I think you'll find that sometimes it is helpful in looking at these tips as you go along with creating your view. 
Now let's talk about the data set type, which I just briefly alluded to. Now all of your data is text, so you'll want to do some things that seem obvious, but you sure can't really do for you. So you'll want to change dates to numbers so that you'll eventually create time sliders and ranges and those types of uh, facet searches on the side that you saw in earlier examples. You want to change image URLs to images, and you want to change latitude and longitude to location. And finally, you might want to change your URLs to live links so people can click on them. Now, here are a few examples about changing our type. So for related date, as I mentioned, it's not text, it's a number, so we'll go ahead and switch that. And then if you look below, you'll notice the image URL is still a URL. But in this next slide, once you click on image, it, goes, it uh, transforms the image URL into the actual image. Okay, so now that we've adjusted our data set for type, we can do the next step, which is augment. And this is our big step in the process because this is what allows us to create the timelines um, and the maps as well as to create some lists. So what the types of uh, fields that we'll be augmenting include the city and state to create a map. We'll be augmenting multiple data values into a list. And then we can also augment dates to create those timelines that we just looked at. The augmenting process is fairly straightforward. You're adding a field when you augment, so you want to click on the Add button right next to the field name, and then you'll notice that you get this data augmentation pop-up window, if you will. Once you click on the map option, and we'll just be using the map option for this example, you are then given a more advanced pop-up window. So we want to use our city and state information, so we can either drag it up or we can click on the plus sign to augment that um, city and state field into a map view. We'll give the new field a name, we'll call it location, and then we'll click on the green create button to augment our field. Okay, so once we clicked um, on the create button, you'll notice at the bottom of our field names, we see our new field, location. And we're given another message to, op to click the augment button to generate data. So at the top is the augment button, and after we click on the augment button, we get notification that all of our fields were successfully augmented. Now, in an ideal world, we will have all the information that we need to be augmented, but more often than not, maybe there's some gaps in our metadata, and that's perfectly fine, as long as you understand that. Um, and you can also go back to your data. This is also a great way of doing quality control on your metadata. Perhaps you can go back and take a look at it and see if there's a way to fill in those gaps. Oftentimes, there might not be, um, which is perfectly fine as well. So if you don't see that green uh, window of success, that's all right, you were still successful. Okay. So now that we're pretty pleased with the state of our data, um, we can go ahead and click Save on the upper right hand of the screen, and then you have an option to give it a title and a description if you would like. Once you do that, you can, you can decide to publish it, to save it, or to make it private. And at any point in time, you can make it private or public. Um, if you're still uncomfortable and maybe you don't want to put it out there in the world just yet, just save it as private. Either way, go ahead and save to make sure you don't lose any of the changes you made to your data. Now this takes us to the build portion of our creation. Um, so once you've augmented your data, it's time to build your view. And I'll be going over the next couple of steps in here, but this is just an overview of what the build process is like. So once you click on build, and you'll notice we're still in our data set, um, you're, selected, you're given a pop-up window and you're asked to select a canvas for your data view. And right now there are four options. So once you select your canvas, and I believe for this example, we went with um, two columns, we're taken into our view mode. And you'll notice the little icon at the top uh, left hand of the screen has changed a little bit. So previously, that little icon that looks like a cylinder was our data mode. And now we're in our build mode. OK, so we selected our two column canvas. And one thing you can also do is select a theme for the background. Right now, these are the themes that are available. And um, you'll notice that some of the users had selected various themes as backgrounds for their views. But I do want to highlight that instantly, ViewShare will create a list view for you um, without even having done anything. And you can keep that list view if you want, or you can click on the X next to the list view if you don't want a list view. Either way, we're going to focus on the middle, which is the Add a View um, column. 
So once we click on Out of View, we'll, we're given an option of Use to Create. So you'll notice that our map um, option is available, but you'll notice that the timeline is unavailable. And it's grayed out because we didn't augment our date. Um, information and that will do during the live demonstration but since we did augment map um, the city and state for the map view we'll go ahead and focus on that for now okay so once you click on map we're given several boxes of information to fill out um, we can rename the label we can describe this as Virginia map we can just call it Fairfax County it, no, ViewShare knows right away to pull from location. That was the newly created field that we augmented from city and state. And then we can also choose the legend or color key, if you will. And it's best to go with a legend that doesn't have too many um, items. So we're going to go with category since there were only four or five of those. Now you also have the option. So when an individual goes and clicks on the item in the map, you either can look at the title and you can pull um, where you want that information to come from. And if there's a link, you can also choose to select that information as well. So one thing you can do at this point, if you're not ready to just save it and just kind of want to get an idea of what things look like so far, you can click on the show preview button. So you'll see this is the map we have created thus far. And as I mentioned earlier, we had 22 objects in our spreadsheet, and this is what the map looks like so far. And you'll notice that there are a couple of pins with multiple items. The two signifies that perhaps two postcards depicted the same place, um, but mostly um, we can also look at the legend for information about the, what the different colors represent. So let's toggle back to our build mode. And let's talk about widgets, which enables users to kind of search in their view. So these, uh, there are several types of widgets that you can choose from, and I'll go over that in the next set of slides. And once again, if you'll notice that a widget is grayed out, it's probably because you don't have the information to make that type of widget possible. So once again, it's a chance to either revisit your original metadata or look at your data set for ways to possibly make sure that those widgets will show up. OK, so we clicked on Add a Widget instead of Add a View. And once we clicked on Add a Widget, we're given these options. So I just highlighted a few that are going to show up um, and ones that are often used. So the search button is great, the list item is great, and then also the slider. By changing the text to number, it enables the slider widget to show up. Another great use of the widgets is the text button. So if you want to tell your audience, like if you click on the item below, then you'll, you're going to be able to engage with the view this way. So don't miss out on using that. OK, so you'll notice that even in our build view, we get a preview of what our widgets look like, which is really nice. Once again, let's go ahead and click on Show Preview to see what our view looks like so far. I actually skipped a step. So I decided to save first because I was pretty confident it was going to look all right. <laughs> so I went ahead and clicked Save, just like with the data set. I saved, um, I put in a title, I added a description, and I decided to make it private for now. So this is what our completed view looks like so far. And right now, we only have a couple views. We have the list in the map view, and we have a couple widgets that users can use to look through um, the set of postcards with this visualization. Now, once you're done with your view, you're not necessarily done with everything. Um, if your view is public, and you notice I made it private, but if your view is public, you have the option to embed your view into a website. And several users have done that, and I'll show an example of that in just a moment. The other thing you can do once you've completed your view, if you're away from your original data, but you need to get access to it, if you notice there's an orange scissor icon on top of the view, if you click on that, you can export your data wherever you are. So if you're public, you'll see an embed option at the top of the view. Just click on that, and you'll notice the blue text box appears with instructions on how to embed your view. Just copy and paste that. And here's an example of an embedded view. This is actually the original funeral records view that I mentioned earlier. And we have an example of how you can export your data here by clicking on the orange scissors and then selecting tab separated values. And then what shows up is a window that looks like a spreadsheet. And you can copy and paste that into a new file if need be. 
So these are some helpful hints that I'll also review. As I mentioned earlier, you can keep your view private or public until you want to share it. And they're kind of difficult to find. So even if you, um, even if you put it out there, it doesn't mean that people will instantly find it right away. Usually you have to type in view share related to whatever it is that you created to find that view. Um, you can update your data. So say you found another postcard you want to add to your data set. You can go ahead and add that row and use the refresh functionality under the inspect option um, to update your information in postcards. So you'll have 23 as opposed to 22. But I should note, refresh only works with the same file and if you don't introduce new columns. If you're adding a whole other field, then you'll have to go through the process of creating your view again. So if you click on inspect, it takes you to this view and you'll click on the refresh link to update your data and your original file, of course. There are some other tools available to enhance your view and ViewShare does address that. There is Omeka and we do talk about how ViewShare and Omeka fit together. That's in the ViewShare website. And there's also this tool called OpenRefine and one of the individuals who created a view talked about using OpenRefine to really make sure that her metadata would show up nicely in ViewShare. If you'd like to read more about that, these are some of the links. There are some other resources as well I'd like to highlight. I mentioned the user's guide earlier. Also, user voice is another place where individuals can mention things they'd like to see or perhaps they have a tip on how to use ViewShare. Um, and then I created a ViewShare libguide a while back that does include links to many of these resources, examples of views, and then it also has a Twitter feed so you can see what people are saying about ViewShare on Twitter. The Signal blog, if you haven't visited yet, is also a great uh, repository of use cases on ViewShare. So if you're interested in learning more about how other individuals and perhaps some of the examples I didn't go into um, are using ViewShare, I would highly recommend looking at that. Just typing in ViewShare to the search box will bring up any articles about it. And there are some great scholarly articles as well. The Crest Collection article was also co-written by Trevor Owens. And Trevor also collaborated on a few other scholarly articles about ViewShare. If you want to get more of a sense about the importance of data visualization in general, they're great articles to read. Finally, we would really appreciate your feedback. So as you're going about creating your view, please don't miss an opportunity to click on the green feedback button. Um, once you click on that, you'll be taken to user voice and you can go ahead and type in any feedback you have about ViewShare. Or perhaps you're experiencing an issue, this is another opportunity to use the button to let us know what you're seeing or what you're not seeing perhaps. And that's the initial um, demonstration of ViewShare as well as examples. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yes. Oh, I can go to the live, I don't, I can try going to the live version, but um, we'll see if we can. Yeah, let's see if that works. Let me do the ship map first. Sure, of course. Okay, so the first question is, to what extent are the tables searchable on the web if they're created in ViewShare? And the second question was looking at the map for the ship's view. So first I'll address the second question and see if we can look at the ship's map. And this might answer the first question to see if we can find it perhaps using an internet search engine. Right, so let me try another. Let's see.
Okay, so you can see that if you don't know the title, it might be a little difficult to locate the actual view. Sure thing. Okay, so here's our map. Sure. There we go. Great, so there's the map for the ships in case you're interested in seeing that as well. Um, so it is a little difficult to search online to find that data. If there's something in particular you're really looking for, um, then you might have greater success. Any other questions? Yes. Did you embed these views in your own website? Yes, absolutely. I actually tried that with a Google website and didn't have any problems with it at all. Yes. When you add the images in the picture, would that be, are you going to talk about that later, the chemistry? Yes, I can definitely do a gallery and how to create one. So the question was if you can add images to once the ship documents are scanned, whether or not they'll be added to this. And they can definitely um, be added in. However, it might require a new column. So it might require recreating this view since it'll include the actual image URL. Yes. Sure, so the question was whether or not you can restrict the number of people who see a private view. And yes, you can do that. And thank you for reminding me, this is something I can definitely share with you. If you have a private view, um, you'll notice at the top right-hand corner, and let me go back to the slides if you don't mind. There is a share link next to the embed link at the upper right hand corner. And once you click on share, it'll provide you with a link you can copy and paste and send to the only individuals you want to see that view. Great, any other questions? Okay, so we'll go ahead and start the live demonstration. Okay, if you'll notice, I'm already logged in to my dashboard and I have a few um, <laughs> data and views here, as you'll notice, but we'll go ahead and download that and or upload rather the spreadsheet that we use throughout the presentation today. So I'll click on upload data first. Select our spreadsheet option. And I have the Fairfax postcard spreadsheet readily available on my desktop. I'll click on upload. And you'll see our new data set that's been added. So I'll make some adjustments to the data set right now. I'll go ahead and start to focus on augmenting now that I made those two adjustments. First thing I'll do is the map. Pull over our city and state to create the map and I'll type in our new field name for that map. And I'll click create. So we'll see location has been added to the bottom of my data set. And click on augment. And this is something you didn't see in the slideshow presentation, but we're given a message cue <laughs> letting us know that it's working hard. 
So we had success with augmenting our city and state information. So I'll next do the timeline. Once again, I'll be adding a new field. Selecting timeline, I'll look for related date. And we'll call this timeline date. I'll click create and see if it shows up at the bottom of our data set, which it does. So I'll go ahead and proceed to click augment. And once again, our values were generated. So we'll go ahead and work on that. Um, the next thing we'll do is I'll actually show you how to create a list, which will facilitate creating a word cloud which we didn't we haven't really talked about much yet. Okay, so our we had several um, postcards with different types of categories that were separated by com by comma. So we're going to use the category as our source property. And as I mentioned, the items were separated by comma. So we'll go ahead and select the pattern that resembles the one in our spreadsheet. So that would be the first one. And if you forget to do something, be sure kindly lets you know. So we'll go ahead and click create. Great, so we augmented three of the possible views that we could create. So let's go ahead and save at this point. So you'll notice our data set now has the three added fields and then some adjustments we made to the um, related date and image URL fields as well. And we're ready to build. So I selected a two column canvas and I'll just stick with the default smooth for now. And we'll work on adding a view first. So I'll go ahead and start with the map view which we looked at in the slideshow demonstration. So you'll notice it defaulted to location, which is the result of augmenting city and state. And we'll fill in some more of these drop downs. Yes. Yes. How come city and state were a text field and not a location field? Correct. So that is a bit puzzling. Um, you could change it if you'd like. Um, if you have, what's interesting is if you do have latitude and longitude coordinates in your spreadsheet, then all you would have to do, you could skip the augment process and just go ahead and mark that as a location and not even worry about augmenting it. So um, that's why that's there. So if you already have the coordinates, um, otherwise you're letting ViewShare know if you just have the city and state to go and grab that, those coordinates. Thank you for asking, that's a great question. Anything else? Great. So I just wanted to mention at this point that this is our data set, if you'll recall, and that you can select or deselect these items to show up when an individual hits on the map pinpoint, if you will. So if you don't want them to see all this information, you can deselect it and, or just leave in whatever it is you want them to see. So for example, if we just want people to see the top four things on this list, we can go ahead and deselect the other things. And this is what our map looks like so far. 
And we're toggling again between the build and preview functionality at this point. So you'll notice um, our timeline option is now available, so we'll go ahead and use that. And I think at this point it's also helpful to mention that if you have a separate start date and a separate end date, it does show those really nice timeline stretches, otherwise they're just like points in time. So if you're looking at your data and you're able to have a start date and end date, that's really nice for using a timeline views. And another thing you can do, depending on the span of your information, is select um, band units. So you can show it by decade and century or century and millennium. Otherwise, I think it's good to just start with the auto default and then just kind of get a sense of what your timeline looks like. So I'll just go ahead and stick with that for now. And this is our timeline view. You'll notice the bars aren't there because we didn't have a start date and an end date, but we do have these points in time. And if someone were to click on one of them, they'll see the associated information. And once again, you can deselect that information as you would like. If you want all of it to appear, some of it to appear as well. I'm going to go ahead and save at this point so we don't lose anything. And if you do save and you need to go back, you can always click on the edit button to continue working on your view or your data sets. So next we're going to focus on adding our widgets. And I'll go ahead and work with some of the widgets that you saw previously, such as the search box and the tag cloud and the slider. Well, the tag cloud is new, um, but you'll see that how that works. So just to point out, you'll notice no commas um, in here because we augmented the view. So if we just stuck with category, you'll notice a lot more information. So it's really nice to kind of clean up that so that when you're created in your word cloud, you're not seeing redundancy. So this is what we have so far, and I'll go ahead and add that gallery of images that I know someone had requested. And you have the ability to sort your images as you'd like. There's also a way to sort them um, once you're actually looking at the view when you're not in the build mode. So even if your users um, see it in an order, they can also go back and, and play with however they want to see that. But it doesn't necessarily change the way that your view is seen. We can sort here, for example. And I'd just like to show you a couple other things you can do um, once you kind of have your preliminary view in place as you're looking through it. You can move items around. If you're wanting users to see perhaps the gallery first, you can make that the first thing that they see. And if you want to rename things, these are just default names as well. So if you want this to be known as a table, you can say it's a table of postcards.
So this is what the view looks like once you've worked on it. And as usual, I find there are, it's an iterative process and that you'll go back to it time and time again and try to find ways to make it perhaps more engaging for your users. Are there any questions at this point? Yes. Precisely. So there are publicly available image URLs. Um, you can use um, a previous group of students used their, I, I think they used Picasso, but I'm not sure if we can still use that anymore. I know Flickr you can use. So if you're looking for a place to have your photos online and publicly available, you can grab the image URL from there. Great. If anyone has any questions, yes. Can we go back to the distribution? Sure. Sure thing, yes. And for the Rhizome art-based view that I mentioned, I actually made the link go back to the original website. So you can also do that as well. You can add a, an, an external URL as well. Yes. In the timeline view, can you change the granularity of the timeline within the timeline view? You can change the band units. Um, Right now, there is no mechanism in place to say that if you want people right away to see a certain decade, um, you can do that. But if your data was only focused on that decade, then it'll obviously appear. But it's not dynamic like the map is. Well, it, it is. Um, but once again, it all depends on several factors. So if we had a postcard that was kind of an outlier, say from Ohio, <laughs> then you're going to see a bigger portion of the United States. So depending on what your information is for your timeline, just keep that in mind. So if you go to the timeline. Sure. Right so this is our latest point. You can drag that around and make it. Right. Less granular or more granular? Well, let's go ahead and play with that a little bit. See if this maybe this possibly helps to answer that. So the question was about um, granularity in your timeline. So this will make everything pretty compressed. Okay, so there's that option, but you can also play around with some other ones as well. I don't know if that helps. So if you want to zero in on 1950. Okay. From, from a user point of view, not a producer point of view. Right, so it won't default to that automatically because you have some later dates. Okay. So if you just had the 50s in that set, and you can create multiple views as well. So say you're just interested in the 50s. Maybe you want to extract that data to create a separate timeline, if you will. Yes? So what, what changes can users make as compared to what creators None at all. It, as if they, unless they know the password. <laughs> um, but yes, this is, your, this is your baby. And so whatever you do to it, whatever you put into it is what will come out. I mean, users have the ability to um, you know, sort, if you will, and then play with the faceted searching as well. But otherwise, they're not changing anything to your view. They're just adjusting the way they're engaging with it. Yes? I think so. Let's try that. So we would scroll over and unfortunately not really see too much happening. <laughs> but um, that that is why I recommend if you're interested in just a specific period, maybe you just want to restrict your data to that time, if that's something you want users to see, or if you're presenting that in other words as well. Yes? Can you tell us how to change order after you upload Excel spreadsheet and then you want to transmit order how it's different as Okay. In lists. Okay. So do you want it to be permanently changed, the order? of which people will see it in, or? No, after you upload your Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. and you want to have all this stuff in a in particular order, like first name, then yes, yes. image, then okay. if you can 
Absolutely. Let me share that. Actually, that requires going back to our data set. So I'm just going to go back a time or I think I can do it in here. I can do it in here. Sorry about that. Okay, this is what I was thinking of our data set. So you can drag and drop. Okay, so is that what you were interested in seeing? Okay, great. Yes? But then if you change the Excel spreadsheet, does it conflict with order? No. Not at all. You can go ahead and change it once, it, once it's um, in here. Yes. Yes. Can a small group collaborate, like say five people have user rights, but then you have to do that as a private group? before it gets uploaded? Not at all. Um, How does that work? So there were several student projects at the University of Maryland this past year, and they did collaborate on similar projects, if you will. And I think the, the longest part of the project was getting that data together. So for example, if one group is working on a spreadsheet and collecting their data for their project, then that takes you know, organizing and managing on, and coordinating on their end. Um, but if it's up to them. I mean, they can definitely have one person in charge of uploading it and then everyone coming in and making edits as, as long as if they all know the password, then they can do that. Yeah, and they can leave it private for as long as they want until they're ready to share it with the world. Great. Any other questions? These have all been wonderful. Um, if you do have future questions, you're more than welcome to get in touch with me. Yes. I'm sorry, I have one more question. Sure. Um, is there a uh, size limit on the data set you can uh, import or that you can augment and use? There is an ideal limit, I would say. Um, it, it go with about 1,000. Um, anything more than that, I think it um, is not really conducive, perhaps even just for visualiz visualization, actually. So I would recommend keeping things under 1,000 at this point. That's what ViewShare can handle. Yes. Did you say that if you want to up, update and you add the additional column to your Excel spreadsheet, you have to redo everything? Correct. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Are there any future plans or enhancements being thought of? Yes. So as I mentioned way earlier in the presentation, we are consolidating some of the steps. So one thing you will be able to see more of, and you can already see now, is that you can see the widgets as you're building, and we're hoping you'll be able to see the view as you're building as well. So there won't be that toggling between build and preview so much, um, which is a little bit of an adjustment, but it's a really great um, opportunity to kind of really engage with what you're looking at and make refinements as you need to. Yes. It works better in some browsers than others. I'll say that. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to the ViewShare website. But yes, it, um, I say there are some browsers where it works much better in than others. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that you need to change everything if you want to add another column to your Excel spreadsheet. What if you just want to add like, one other picture slash like one of these? Sure. So if you're adding a row, you just have to use the refresh functionality, which is under inspect. Um, and that's not an issue. So like I said, if you found another postcard um, and you want to add it as another, like your 23rd object as opposed to the 22 we have now, um, that's pretty easy to do. But unfortunately at this time, if you're going to create another column, like say you want to explore, um, say that you found people <laughs> and you want to add people um, as another category, um, to search by, then you would have to in redo the whole process again. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.